Amen for voices. God gave us voices <laughs> to use them. Lord, use mine now to uh, impart your word this morning. And Father, just uh, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a unique opportunity here this morning to hear from God in a unique way. You could go to a podcast or a YouTube video or anywhere and hear much better preaching and teaching than you're going to hear from me this morning. But God has given us thing called, this thing called the local church and pastors and teachers uh, to hear directly from him in a way that you can't hear through a podcast or a media, online media. And to hear through imperfect vessels the perfect word of God. And his word, his unique word for you today, um, straight from him to you. And I pray that many of you will receive from him today in a unique way. Let's stand to read our passage for this morning. It's in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you, in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. This is simply a magnificent passage of scripture. This is the authoritative, infallible, true and correct, necessary, and sufficient Word of God. You may be seated. And truly a magnificent passage of Scripture. I always think, oh, this is my favorite passage, or this is a great one. Well, it's the Bible, so how do you put one piece above the other? If I were shipwrecked on an island, and my one little piece from my Bible blew up next to me, and it was all I had of the Bible for the rest of my life isolated on this island, this may be the passage I would like to have in hand. <laughs> it is a doxology, and yet it is rich with content. It contains theology and Christology, expression, exposition of God and of Christ that forms the bedrock of the creeds. Jesus is the great subject of the scriptures and the creeds that are based upon them. It contains cosmology and a biblical worldview, a description of reality that sets the Christian worldview in stark contradistinction to the imagined and invented worldviews of man and their false religions. Jesus is the great reference point for all reality as it can and should be known, understood, and defined. As part of this, it contains anthropology and angelology, the full spectrum of created beings. Jesus is the great creator of every creature, human and other. It contains ecclesiology, ex exposition on the most unique of all societies into which humans gather, the church. Jesus is the great head of this great society. It contains soteriology and missiology, doctrine of salvation, 
and the gospel of salvation to all creation. It is political and sociological. That which concerns power, authority, control, and governance, order and structure in not just the cosmos, but in society. And Jesus is the power and authority above all power and authority. He is king of kings, emperor of emperors, president of presidents, magistrates of magistrates, chairman of chairmen. Against the political and social turmoil of our day, this passage is a breath of fresh air, renewing and restoring perspective. Recall that our missionary speaker several weeks ago answered a question about what most concerns him about his home country and his home church. And he mentioned that as he comes back from living internationally, he notes that the people in his church, in his country, his home, home country, are just angry and frustrated and anxious, more than he's ever seen before. And there's a lot going on in our society today in our rapidly changing world that is a source of anger, frustration, and anxiety. But when I read this passage, it puts everything into perspective for me. New and right perspective. What could we possibly hear in the social and the news media that should shake us given this? Should the state of our world and the direction of our society is taking rally us to concern and action? Yes. But not to anger, frustration, and anxiety. Even when history took its darkest turn, when Jesus was on the cross, he was still on his throne. And he still is. And it's a throne above all thrones. We as Christians have all the answers to all the questions anybody needs. The reason and purpose for every problem, every form of suffering. We have it. We have the keys to those things. We can say without flinching in the face of all that we see that's a source for anger and frustration and anxiety. Two absolutely true and certain things about all problems and suffering that we see. Number one, in them is meaningful purpose. And number two, in them is redemptive opportunity. As Christians, we do not respond to the growing problems of our day with anger, frustration, and anxiety. We need only seek the meaning and purpose that God has in them and to seize upon their redemptive opportunities. So let's do a bit of a breakdown here and identify the larger themes in this passage. Verse 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And here we find the essential nature of Christ and the relation of Christ to the creation, to all of the creation. The next portion, verse 18 to 20, he is also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And here we have Included the relation of Christ to the Father God, to the church, and to the redeemed creation. And the third section, verses 21 to 23. 
And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And here we find the relation of you to Christ and the Father, establishing and maintaining right relation as well. If we consider a synthesis and some implications, an inescapable takeaway from this great passage is this, the greatness of its subject, Jesus Christ. There simply is nothing greater except maybe the Father God himself and the Spirit who together are one and the same with Jesus. Among gods and men, there is nothing greater. The things we think are great are so much lesser. And I could elaborate all day on this, but I'll just use one simple illustration from the vast pool of literature into which I have delved. Consider this quote from an avowed atheist, author, Douglas Adams, from one of his novels in which he seeks to, in a humorous tongue-in-cheek way, deny God and question the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Some of you may know these works, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The, the Life, the Universe, and Everything, um, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish and the Restaurant at the End of the Universe. And he says in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, space is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down to the, the road to the chemist, the pharmacy, but that's just peanuts to space. And many are such observations on the vastness of space by renowned authors, philosophers, scientists, to which the Christian answer is, based on our passage today, Jesus is great. Really great. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly great he is. I mean, you may think the vastness of space and the universe is great, but that's just peanuts to the greatness of Jesus. Who made space and the universe, he didn't just make it, he holds it all together. And that's my commentary on The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the commentary of this passage. Who is not intimidated by the bowler who shows up with his uh, pearl inlaid bowling ball in its leather case, right? And you're thinking, I'm losing this match, right? Or the billiards player who shows up with his nice wooden case in his cue and he puts it together and you know that you are facing certain defeat at the hands of this master pool player. Jesus shows up to life and to every religious debate with his own universe. <laughs> and with every answer to every question of life, the universe, and everything. With a founder like Jesus, how can the Christian religion not far surpass every other religion and philosophy and notion or thought in the mind of man in every way? Jesus is not the founder of a religion among religions. He is the center of what is true religion. Christianity is not a religion made by man, like all the others. 
It is the religion by which and for which man was made. A few weeks ago, we heard from one of our missionaries about Tibetan Buddhism, if you will recall. A religion with whom or what at its center? Buddha. Buddha was a living person who founded a religion. How do Jesus and Buddha compare, just for one example, as founders of a religious movement or a religious system? Buddha made the Buddhist religion the Buddhist religious system. Jesus made Buddha. Who wins? (laughs) He mentioned a syncretism with the pantheon of gods from animistic religion in Tibet. Very similar to what we encountered in Mongolia. There was a direct parallel. I could just relate exactly to what he was saying. Dark powers, spirits of occultic religion. Jesus has power over these powers, as we just read. They are subject to him. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is the greatest. His love is the greatest. His wrath is the greatest. Everything about him is the greatest form of that thing. He is not merely great. We run into real problems with language and the use of adjectives with God in this manner. He is not merely great as though there is a measure and standard of greatness apart from him to which he measures up. He is greatness itself. He is the measure. We're committing a form of an error when we say Jesus is great. No, whatever's great, whatever greatness is, he's it. He is the standard by which all greatness is defined as great or not. He is preeminent, ultimate, supreme, sovereign. In him is allness, everythingness, completeness, fullness, wholeness, awesomeness in its true meaning, not the flippant meaning that it has evolved into. In terms of application, What does this mean for us? What do we do with this? Other than sit back in awe and exhaustion of mind trying to contemplate it. What is the takeaway from this? Paul calls us out personally in verse 21. He turns from looking at Jesus in his greatness to us. And although you were, what is your relation to the great one, to Jesus? Are you still alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds as all of us were, are, according to verse 21 and according to verse 17? In him all things hold together, so to not be in right relation with him, to he by whom all things hold together, is a desperate place to be. To the Athenians, Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. So to be broken in relation with him is to perish, to be directionless. To be alive and yet to lack true living being, dead in soul. I will say, however, often the focus of our appeal is on the lowness of the sinner and not on the greatness of the Savior. Paul alights briefly upon the desperate state of the one not in right relation to Jesus, and he makes brief mention of this as a thing of the past and moves quickly to the reality and truth of the great salvation for these believers. Reconciled, able as unholy sinners to stand before the holy God, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. 
Because, we read in verse 20, he has made peace through the blood of the cross. Made peace? With what? What's the problem here? With whom? With God the Father. You are saved from sin. If you're in right relation with Jesus, yes. You are saved from death. But sin is merely a secondary factor and death but a consequence of the true problem. More primarily than this, you are saved from God himself. Sin is a problem because God is a holy God. Death is the result of violating his holiness and subsequent alienation from he, the giver of life. How great a salvation is it? It is no less than a salvation from God, by God, for God. Is the alienated and hostile in attitude, indifferent, satisfied in your sin, your present? Or your past? If it is your past, you are living the reality of your new and holy and blameless and beyond reproach life. And if it is your present, it can become your past. Even now, no waiting. By trusting in your Creator, in Jesus Christ, as Redeemer, the one who has made peace. Confessing your alienation and hostility and sin and turning from it to him. The only one who can cleanse and save you. Oh, what a truly great Savior. Greatest and only Savior. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. Not Buddha, not any of the Hindu gods invented by men who are made by Jesus, not any of the false Jesuses of Mormonism and the Christian cults, not the Jesus-denying Messiah to come of Judaism, not the God stripped of his true attributes of Islam, not faith in Jesus plus something else, as in Roman Catholicism, not any of the promises of secularism and humanism and all the isms wrapped up in our current postmodernism, not any of the new false religions and idolatries intended to replace and substitute for Christ and Christianity of identityism, cosmic justiceism, scientism, neo-Marxism, and neo-socialism, and the many forms of worthy causism detached from God and what really matters to him. Not any of the man-made saviors and their false gospels, all and any of the others that cannot save. If you are in right relation with Jesus, among other things that are great, Where do you place him? Where is Jesus on your scale of greatness compared to other things? Is he the creator God, redeemer, head over the church, and every power that exists and described here? If he is that, he will be over and above everything else in your life. On your list of great things, there should be nothing above him. King David makes this audacious statement about the Lord, this God Jesus. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Really? (laughs) Really, David? Nothing else? Nothing you have, nothing you desire? Not that David doesn't have anything else, obviously, or desire anything else, or have any plans for the evening. But what compared to the Lord, when compared to the Lord, all those other things, they were insignificant. 
in a different class and category of importantness altogether. He's saying that ultimately, all things considered, nothing holds the place of greatness that Jesus holds in his life. If everything else is taken away, there is no real loss given the greatness of his greatest possession, Jesus and his relationship with Jesus. Should it come to a contest, hands down, nothing else matters. Paul makes this crazy statement. But I do not consider my life of any account to me as dear to myself, so that I may finish the race, finish the course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly to the gospel of God's grace. Acts 20:24. 20, really, Paul? As nothing of no account? One translation says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Again, not that Paul didn't value his life, but by comparison, his very life was not regarded as great as his Lord. Compared to his very own life, his Lord and the mission he had from his Lord was greater. His life could be set aside if the preservation of it should in any way interfere or conflict with his greatest value and his highest task. If only I might finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. May we all say with David and with Paul, of comparable worth to you and your greatness is nothing in my possession, nor on this earth, not even my very own life. If Jesus is great to you, are you growing in your knowledge of him? So this last week I was doing my homework for my weekly um, time with Grudem Systematic Theology with Levi, sometimes monthly, sometimes bi-monthly, <laughs> as our lives have been a little mixed up. And I'm in the, just reading through the chapter on Christ, God's knowability. And I ran across this this really important thought in a section on his knowability. And I'm faced with the idea that God is infinite and we are finite or limited. At the same time, I've be, been reflecting on the greatness of Christ for this message. And I found two things nicely related. And Grudem says this, because God is infinite and we are finite or limited, we can never fully understand God. In this sense, God is said to be incomprehensible, where the term incomprehensible is used with an older and less common sense, unable to be fully understood. This sense must be clearly distinguished from the more common meaning, unable to be understood. It is not true to say that God is unable to be understood, but it is true to say that he cannot be understood fully or exhaustively. Consider this from the Psalms. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite beyond measure. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. We cannot make God too big or too great. Herein is a fantastic paradox, and within it an amazing truth that it should affect how we live every day we live. God is too big and too great to know completely, yet to know him is to know self, to live, and to have fullness of life. We cannot know him completely, but one of our chief aims in life is not to give up because of how incomprehensible he may be, but to know him as much as we can, as a lifelong endeavor. All the longer, all the deeper, higher and greater. We can spend our whole lives knowing more, and we are meant to. We were created for that purpose. We will never exhaust what can be learned or grasped about his greatness. Let's look back in our chapter here in Colossians to last week, the previous section, Colossians 1, 
9 to 10, it says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. But we don't do this alone. We become part of that new great society, a new family and community of faith that does this together. If you are in right relation with Jesus and are growing in your knowledge of him, what is your relation with the church? Through right relation with him, you enter his church. Not by being in church on Sunday morning or even every day of the week, although that is important and good also. His church is the greatest society, community, family that exists among all of them. In the first generation in church in Mongolia, I found that it was a challenge to get Mongolians to see church the right way, to place it in the right place of importance in their lives. And I found the perfect example in the traditional Mongolian homestead. We have a picture of it here. And in the middle of every Mongolian gear, it's called, this felt house that they live in, that they survive in sub-zero temperatures for months of the year, is this fireplace. And in Mongolian, it's called a gollumt. Or, and that you, word would be used figuratively for, say, a father. My father is my gollumt. <laughs> it's the hearth, the place of warmth in a cold place, the place of sustenance for your hunger and your your daily and bodily needs. As important as this gear is to the physical survival in Mongolia for Mongolians, so Christ's church is to the spiritual survival and well-being of every believer. It should be the hearth that they come to for warmth and sustenance. But we do not tend to treat the church that way, do we? <laughs> Instead, often it's more like a park we visit a mall we shop in, a club we're part of, a stadium at which we spectate, dare I tread there. <laughs> not that those things aren't good, but they're not the center of our life. They're not the society that we're a part of. It is to be the home and the hearth fire of our life, the church is. If you're a member of his church, this ought to be your relation to his church. It ought to be in this place in your life? Do you have a relationship with his church at all? Are you right related, rightly related to Jesus? And if so, a member of his church. And if a member, are you a servant or a minister? And I'll close with this. We don't do this alone, and this, it is not this work alone that we do. If Jesus is the greatest, we will work to know him and serve him. If Jesus is the greatest, are you serving him, his church, and his commission? As Paul says in verse 23, his concluding statement, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And indeed, you as well are made a minister. If you are in right relation to Jesus and his church, you have a mission that you are called to, a ministry. As a disciple of the great minister, a follower of him, you learn from him and grow in him and minister in service for him. Bearing fruit in every good work, again, last week's passage, and increasing in your knowledge of God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Are you ministering? Are you serving? In this doxology, Jesus' greatness is extolled. And this doxology ends with action. For this greatest great one, I have been made a minister. Oh, what a great privilege that is. Christ's greatness must be testified of to others. We have this ministry as his disciples, his followers, his servants, his ministers. If we don't do it, as we were reminded several weeks ago, very concretely with a rock up here, the rocks will do it, right? 
God's purposes in human society and in the nations will be accomplished, and he chooses us as his instruments for doing it. Is he great to you? Is he the greatest? Apart from him, what truly do you have? If he is great to you, you are his minister. You, we have a mission. We are his ministers. We have a commission in the church, in this community, in the world, on the basis of his greatness. May we all be found faithfully ministering in word and deed to one another, to those who need him around us, indeed, as Paul indicates here, to all creation under heaven. Let's pray. Father God, no one has ever seen you, but Jesus Christ has made you known. Help us to know you better by better knowing Jesus in whom your fullness dwells. Help us to put him in the right place above everything. Everything else in our lives. And to have the power and the courage to live greater in keeping with Jesus' greatness. Forgive us for our small and reduced views of you and of him. Thank you for lowering yourself to our level by taking on human flesh and establishing relation with us through Jesus. I pray that if anyone here does not have a right relation with you, that you would make clear to them what steps to take to make this happen. I ask that if anyone here is not in right relation with your community of faith, the church, that you would do the same. Help them to find that place of belonging and service and ministry that will make them fruitful for you and your glory and fulfilled in their life as your follower, disciple, and worshiper. It's in Jesus' great name we ask.